Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Russell Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy, also known as the Anxiety MD, is a medical doctor who is an expert in anxiety. Dr. Kennedy knows anxiety as both doctor and patient, and he's become an anxiety expert in an effort to heal his own chronic worry. Along with his MD degree, he has degrees in neuroscience and advanced training developmental psychology. But his approach is more ethereal than his formal education would suggest. Hello, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Leah. Thank you so much for having me on your program. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. And I know we have a lot of ground to cover today, so I thought we would just jump right into questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so my first one's kind of simple, but maybe not, because some people might not understand this. What is the difference between fear and anxiety, in your opinion? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, fear is something we need. Fear is a necessary emotion. So if I walk outside and a herd of elephants is about to stamp, you know, trample me, right. I get fear, a fear reaction. And then that fear reaction makes me jump out of the way. Now, if I'm upstairs in my bedroom the night before, worried that if I walk outside my you know, downtown Victoria, you know, house that a group of elephants are going to trample me, that's anxiety, you know, so anxiety is all about the future. Whereas fear, fear happens in the moment and fear you have to deal with in the moment. But most of us confuse what fear is with anxiety. And I always ask people to ask this one question, do I have to do something about this right now? Mm -hmm. So if I'm being going to be trampled by elephants, yes, I've got to do something. That's fear. If I don't have to do something about it right now, that's probably anxiety. What a great distinction. That is very useful. Absolutely. All right. So one of the main points that you highlight in a lot of your work is that our focus should be on healing the alarm that lives in your body and spending less time and energy on the worrisome thoughts that occupy the mind. Would you elaborate on that concept for us? Okay, I'm going to go back a little bit and say, because I, I got raised by a family who my father had schizophrenia and bipolar. Okay. So I always like to say my father was psychotic and my mother was neurotic. So my psyche never stood much of a chance. So, <laughs> so what happened is when you grow up in this, this environment and my mother was very loving and caring and stuff. It's not like I grew up in this horribly dysfunctional environment. That's not true. But the problem with my dad is I never knew where he was going to stand. He was never violent or abusive, but it was very, dis, you know, very disconcerting for me. So I grew this sort of what I call alarm in my system, this kind of my body kind of grabs a hold of this alarm. Uh, and it's not the same, but it's similar to, to combat veterans, you know, uh, when they're in a war zone. Uh -huh. And then they're, they're always, they're, there's always a chance they could be killed at any moment. So they, they build this sense of alarm in their bodies. And I think as children, we do the same thing. So I have this alarm that's in my body and all the talking in the world wasn't going to make much of a difference. I mean, I did talk therapy for 25 years or so, and it didn't really seem to help. And it wasn't until I started doing more somatic things. My wife's a somatic trauma therapist. So okay. she goes into your old traumas and she'll say, okay, well, you know, tell me about, and I tell her about this one time that I was watching them take my father away in an ambulance to the mental hospital for like the umpteenth time. And I was sitting at the window and I was heartbroken. And I was like, what can I do about this? Like, what can I do about this? Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, well, one day I'm going to make this mean something. One day I'm going to do something. So I became a doctor and that wasn't quite enough. But coming back to the original question, I think we all have this alarm, at least people that suffer and struggle with anxiety, have this alarm that's trapped in our body mm. and we, mis we misconstrue it as, as a problem with our mind. Mm. I think our mind is this chronic, make sense, meaning making machine. And when it feels this alarm in your body, it has to make sense of it. It's an uncomfortable feeling, this alarm that we hold in our system. So our brain says, wow, we're really feeling this discomfort. It must be that there's going to be something bad happening. And people with anxiety always say, you know, I feel like there's this sense of impending doom. Something's going to happen. So your brain, which is a very complicated, imaginative organ, makes up a story or a worry about this feeling. It may not even be aware of its feeling in the alarm, but it's making the story up from this old alarm that's trapped in my system from growing up in this household that was pretty chaotic at points. So I spent so much time trying to fix the thoughts of my mind. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we can talk about this later about how I found that the alarm was actually stuck in my body. 
And then once I started addressing the alarm directly, putting my hand over it, breathing into it, really feeling it, kind of commiserating with it, because I do feel that that alarm is your younger self. It is the part of you that was traumatized. It was the part of you that's still kind of frozen behind that tree, afraid to move. And until you move that alarm, the thoughts of the mind don't really change. So that's why I think we have such a hard time fixing this in therapy is because we're trying to fix the thoughts of the mind when the problem is actually rooted in the body. And I was writing this in my book today and I said, you know, if you have a fire on first street, why are you sending all the fire trucks to third street? (laughs) <laughs> because you're not you're not going to solve the underlying problem. So if what I'm saying is that if you're trying to fix the thoughts and the problem is actually somewhere in your body and you hold it in your chest or your throat or whatever, you're never going to fix the underlying problem. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a hard time with therapy these days is people go and talk therapy for, you know, 5, 10, 20 years and at the end of that 20 years they're not a whole lot better. Thing but but basically what it comes down to is I believe that there's alarm in the body And there's the thoughts of the mind. And what the thoughts of the mind do is they make up these worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then that makes the alarm in the body trigger. And then the more alarm you get in the body, the more the thoughts trigger. And you get in this alarm anxiety cycle and you can't break it. And I, you know, basically the whole book is about breaking this cycle so that you can stop making yourself worse. And I think basically that's what we do with anxiety is we actually make ourselves worse by thinking about it when thinking is making us worse as opposed to getting us better. So we do the thing that is actually making us worse, believing that it's making us better. Absolutely, and I think it's uh, the polyvagal theory that we talked about a few weeks ago, maybe that's how we met, but the triggers from just things in our environment that also like get us back into that alarm. Yes. Maybe not just our own thoughts, because our inner thoughts and our inner feelings can be triggers, but so can environmental triggers, is that true? Absolutely, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I saw a, a YouTube video the other day of a, a boy who grew up with a schizophrenic father, and I started to go into alarm. I started to dissociate a little bit. I started going into that dorsal vagal kind of shutdown, and oh no, I don't want to have to deal with this kind of stuff. And I recognize it because I see it early in myself now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, there's definitely triggers that come from both inside and outside, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. At what age did you realize that your father had schizophrenia? That's a really good question because up until I was about seven or eight, I thought my dad was awesome. You know, he taught me how to ride a bike. He taught me how to throw a ball. He was like a provincial basketball or baseball coach of the year or something like that. But around eight, I just started having this sense that I, you know, something wasn't quite right and nothing I could put my finger on or whatever. But by the time he was about, or I was about 10 or 11, I really started seeing like he would, kind of disappear for a week at a time and um, my mother wouldn't say but but you know he'd say oh he's gone for a while and he'd actually be in the mental hospital you know so I think a kid knows I think we know as children that something is not right we may not know the exact mechanics of what's going on but I knew something was wrong so I would say if I had to, to, to guess I would say around 10 you know around 10 is when I really started thinking there's something not right about this guy mm-hmm. This is fascinating to me because we just met, but (laughs) I have such a similar story and it's not funny, but it's funny how similar my story is. My dad would disappear four weeks at a time. He had schizophrenia and I remember the age of seven, something major happening and just being like, whoa, (laughs) who is this person? And my mom explained it to us too and just said he's sick at a hospital so it's just interesting that's why I'm smiling when you're talking it's not because it's funny it's because I cannot believe how much I relate to the story well you know I I I think we we talked before like I was a stand-up comic in Vancouver for 15 years yes 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 so so I would work in the urgent care clinic as a doctor in the daytime and then I would go out at night and do you know between two and six or seven sets a week in the in the comedy clubs so humor has been a way for me and and especially with my mother too because you know, my mother really struggled with my dad's illness. Yeah. So I would make her laugh. You know, that's how I, that's how I sort of built my sense of humor. I would make her laugh. I would do like Monty Python impressions and, you know, all this sort of stuff that would make her laugh because when she laughed, the whole household kind of raised up a little bit because she was, she did the laundry. She made the meals. She was the main breadwinner. She was a registered nurse. You know, to this day, I look back, I don't know how she did all that stuff, but 
you know, she, you know, she, she comes from war stock. She was bombed, you know, in, in the Blitz in Britain. And, you know, she's tough, man. She's 86. My mom's 86 and wow. probably in better shape than I am. Oh, what a story. Yeah. I need to interview her. Sounds you like. Should. You should. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right she'll, talk, she'll talk your ear off. For yeah. Sure. Well, hey, I don't like to have to talk. So I like it when other people do the talking for me. <laughs> Okay, so I have another question for you. What do you feel that allopathic medicine may overlook when it comes to healing the body? And maybe just start by explaining the difference between allopathic and naturopathic, just because the word allopathic isn't that well known. I mean, allopathic medicine would be kind of like orthodox medicine, Western medicine, you know, traditional medicine. You know, you go to the eMERGE, uh, you go to your family doctor, you know, you go for blood pressure, that kind of stuff, like office visits and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, and And as a rule kind of allopathic medicine is we deal with symptoms, you mm -hmm. know? So if someone, if someone has, you know, high blood pressure, we deal with that. If someone has a heart attack, we'll deal with that. If someone has, uh, you know, chronic headaches, we'll deal with that. And we kind of reduce things down to illnesses a lot of the time. So when we see someone with, you know, chronic headaches, we'll do a CT or an MRI to rule out tumors and all that kind of thing. And then we'll sort of usually give them a medication at some kind. Whereas more of the alternative practitioners, you know, the naturopaths, chiropractors, um, you know, to some extent, the, the, the osteopaths, although they're more medical than than the general alternatives, they'll look at the whole system. Like, how's your sleep? What do you, what, you know, what's your diet like? How are you, you know, how are you interacting with your family? Mm -hmm. So the thing that I, you know, got out of allopathic medicine was for, because my, my superpower is basically being able to see into people and within probably 20 minutes, I can tell you where your traumas are. And, wow. and that, yeah, and that's kind of like this intuitive kind of medical intuitive thing that I have, I've had since I was a child. But it, the problem with me is that I would see people coming in to my office who had 10 minutes to talk to me, and I would see a guy come in, and I could tell that he was beaten by his dad from the time he was like eight years old till he was 13. I can kind of see it in my mind. I get a picture of it. So I can't open that can of worms in 10 minutes. You know, the guy's coming in because he's got this chronic pain in his shoulder because we can't fix it. And because we can't fix it, his x-rays are normal, his CT is normal, his MRI is normal, his physio says, I can't find anything wrong. And basically, the problem's emotional. So, you know, it's hard. it was really hard for me to kind of give those people um, anti-inflammatories mm -hmm. or something that was, you know, quote unquote, deal with the pain because I knew the pain was coming from unresolved trauma from his childhood, which I don't want to, you know, say everything is unresolved trauma from your childhood, but so many things are, you know, it, it, you know, doing this for 25 years, I would see people and I would, I would, I would, and I would always ask, you know, what was your childhood like? And, and often I would have families in my practice so I could see, you know, how the grandfather was, the father was, the kids were like, I could see their personalities and, and I knew the, the issues, you know, if somebody was, was an alcoholic. I knew how that affected the family. If somebody was uh, physically abusive, I knew how that handled, the, went through the family. So the, the trouble was I would have 10 minutes to deal with these deeply set emotional wounds and I just burned out, like I couldn't do it anymore. So, you know, I left in 2013 and I just decided that I'm gonna become an author and kind of a speaker and, and really hone what I know about anxiety. So I went to India, you know, I studied there, I lived there, I studied there. I became a yoga and meditation teacher in 2007 to kind of get the other kind of more ethereal side. Um, got into stand-up comedy, did all these sort of other things that are outside of conventional medicine, just so that I could see medicine from a very, very different perspective. You know, and I also, you know, we've talked a little about this before, did, um, you know, psilocybin, LSD, you know, that kind of stuff, not to get high, because that wasn't my, my goal. My right. goal was to examine my own mind from as many perspectives as I could. And I, that's why I went to India. That's why I became a yoga teacher. And to some extent, that's why I became a stand-up comedian. Because I really want to understand what happens to us in anxiety. Like, why are so many of us suffering from it? And why aren't people getting better? That's my thing. Like, why aren't people getting better? Right, exactly. And I honestly think you are a rare breed. But the kind so many of us are looking for, the kind of doctor that we want to have like because if we don't get to the root of the issue we're just gonna to have to keep coming back and maybe you want us to keep coming back no i'm just kidding because so many doctors say 
it'll put me out of business if I just tell them what's really wrong. I've heard doctors actually say that. I had a heart doctor say that to me. He's like, it's one of the few fields that there's a cure talking about um, ablation and yeah. you don't see your patients anymore. So it's yeah. almost like he was saying that doctors avoid those fields because then they won't have any work. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about that is that, you know, I had, you know, sometimes I would have 50 patients to see in like a six to eight hour shift. You know, I was really popular. I, so you know, I would start at nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning because I worked Saturday. That was my big shift. And everybody would, you know, come in and see me. And then I would have, you know, I, I would have this computer screen and it would tell me uh, I did everything for electronic medical records, but it would tell me how many people were waiting and how long they were waiting. So sometimes I would look over at the screen and see the next person that is, is in to see me has been waiting two hours and 42 minutes to see me. And that caused a great deal of stress in me too, because on one hand, I, I wanna give this person the best service that I can because she's been waiting for almost three hours, but I also have a list a mile long of people behind her that I have to get to as well. So, you know, the whole thing really, allopathic medicine for me, and I think it's a great field for a lot of people, um, but it, it just wasn't for me. I just couldn't, I couldn't stay in it and just, and it was just, it was making me really anxious, right. you know, and alarmed. It was really just kicking up my alarm because I felt this impotence. And I think it was the same impotence that I felt when I watched my dad get, you know, put into an ambulance again. Like I just, you know, got more and more anxious and eventually said, can't do this, can't do this anymore. So I, I left in 2013, but it, it took a full uh, left Achilles rupture before Absolutely. I would actually quit. A literal yeah. Achilles yep. rupture? Had to, have okay. had to have surgery, put it back together. I, I was going in in February of 2013, seeing a patient, then going to the bathroom, breathing, calming myself down, doing a couple of yoga poses maybe, going out, seeing another patient, mm. going back in, breathing, I told the staff, it's like, um, I think I've got some stomach issues today and that kind of thing. But it was just like, I was just burned out. And I just, as most doctors will tell you, it becomes such a part of our identity that to leave it, and when I left it, it was really difficult. Um, yeah. To leave it, you know, they don't use the term indoctrinated for nothing because you really feel like this is part of my identity. You yeah. know, like when you finish medical school, they, you know, you're Dr. Russell Kennedy at that point. And, uh, you know, there's no other job that really does that. Maybe you have the president or something. They don't call you like Jackhammer Johnson or, or, or Plumber Jones, you know, like you're Dr. Russell Kennedy for the rest of your life. Kind of stuff. But I'm just saying it was so hard for me to release that identity as a physician. And, uh, you know, so, so, you know, I used to give my opinion 40 times a day. And now, you know, I, I talk to the dogs a lot because I work out of home and I write. So, so I give my opinion to my dogs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> which you're still hearing it so it's doing some good because even when we talk out loud to ourselves there's a different way that we process information that's true that is very true from a neuroscience point of view that's a, oh. your, your speaking brain and your receiving brain are very different nice see that's what helps for you to have those extra degrees because you can put this whole thing together and make sense of it all it doesn't have to be these disconnected parts that don't really yeah i totally agree with you leah i think that that's you know because when i was younger i was thinking well you know, why am I a stand-up comedian and, and a doctor and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and a neuroscientist uh -huh. and, and a yoga teacher? Like, what do these things have to do with each other? And eventually, you know, once I got to 50, it was like, oh, okay, I can kind of see how these things would all go together. But at the time, you know, I've always been a bit of a misfit. I, I, I freely admit that. I didn't start med school until I was 26. Mm -hmm. um, I've been married three times, you know, last time's the charm. Mm -hmm. For sure. But you know, it's, I've always been a bit of a misfit. I've always looked at the world in a very atypical way. And I think that's why you don't see too many, you know, medical doctors who are, you know, touring stand up comedians at the same time, because <laughs> I have two different types of my brain. And then when I write medical stuff, yeah. uh, and I try and put humor in it, it just doesn't work. Because my medical brain and my, my humor brain are very different and they hate wow. each other and they don't like talking to each other. So my humor brain, I can stay in my medical brain. I can stay in, but mixing the two of them can be really difficult for me. Right. That's so interesting. And one question I wanted to ask you, cause you said earlier, you can see a patient and within five or 10 minutes, you can, you can know what's wrong 
on the inside. Tell me how you do that. Or is that just like an intuition thing for you that was gifted? It's an, intu you? It's an intuition thing. It's, okay. I think it's on, on some level, I think it's archetypal too. Like, I think I can see people who are people pleasers, you know, mm -hmm. and I can, I can extrapolate sometimes from that. If somebody comes in and sees me as a, a people pleaser, I can sometimes, you know, track back from there, you know, where did they get that from? Well, did they, did they have a, a mother who was sick or a father who was absent? You know, did they have to, like, I, I try and draw the facts out of what I see in front of me. So if someone's a narcissist, you know, and I wonder, you know, or everything in the interview is about them, about them, about them. I wonder how they didn't get their needs met as children, you know, and then I, you know, bring that back to parents, grandparents, that kind of stuff too. So there is a method to it. It isn't like I just, you know, sort of look at them like, you know, that I've got some psychic picture in there. Some, some people I do, some people I can actually get pictures of, you know, abuse or abandonment um you know one one girl i i saw i saw her being uh abandoned in a cartier jewelry store her mother left to go into the vault or whatever it is and left her out in the middle of the the thing and i said were you in a cartier store and this is where this is where i don't say this to people very often uh <laughs> but but it's because it freaks them out like it really freaks them out you know when you don't know them from anything and then you tell them one of the stories that really impacted their life. They really, they sit down, they kind of hold on to the edges of the chair and they're like, okay, like, did my mother tell you this? It's like, nope, I don't know your mother, you know? So typically, you know, that, that's, that's, a st that's a story, but typically I don't share, because again, I only have 10 minutes, right? So I can't, yeah, you know, yeah. I can't rip somebody open in front of me and they go, okay, sorry, ding, yeah. time to go, yep. you know? So it's a combination of experience Okay. Um, what they tell me and then sometimes I'll, I'll get a little vision on there and sometimes they're completely wrong so it's not like I'm some genius you know but a lot of times they, there's they may not they may not be exactly right but the the archetype of what's going on is definitely there and the big thing about that is usually I can tell whether or not someone has an emotional pain or a problem or it's a physical pain or a problem so that really helps when I'm looking at somebody for cancer or something like that. It's like, yes. if, if I, if I see that there's a lot of emotion behind this, it's more about probably an emotional thing. Uh, whereas if I see somebody with a secure childhood, they seem to, you know, interact, they make good eye contact. They seem to be connected with me and they're having bowel symptoms. I'm a little more, you know, suspicious that this may be a, that this may be a tumor of some kind. Not saying that people who are, you know, anxious don't get tumors either, but I just get a sense if, if, you know, if this is, if this is a real, you know, physical illness or if there's a lot of emotional energy, like the guy I was telling you about at the start with the shoulder that nobody could figure out. And it was just because, you know, he got beaten, he got beaten. And, and once, and, and, and the story that he tells me is that when I was about 12 or 13, he said, I punched my father in the face and almost knocked him out. And he punched him with his right arm. It was his right holder that was hurting. So all this, this is what I find fascinating. Like this is, this is the stuff that really just turns my crank because I kind of see where these, all these sort of semi-spiritual things fit together uh, because I do consider myself a scientist. You know, sometimes when I talk about like inner child stuff, I want to have a seizure because I was trained in this, you know, allopathic, logical, left brain, linear fashion. And when I start going off like that, you know, <laughs> I don't know where I am sometimes. I think it's a good place though. I honestly do because you are open minded because you have those places where you don't not quite sure if you're in this, the allopathic or the naturopathic, that's a good place to be because we should always be asking questions yeah. and open to different answers in my opinion. That's All right. Open. So I asked about um, what allopathic medicine is missing when it comes to the body. Oh. Mind. What about conventional psychology? What are they missing kind of along those same lines? You know, the thing about conventional psychology is most conventional psychologists are trained through a university mm -hmm. and the universities need specific, you know, sort of metrics. So if you go in and you have depression and you go into a university training program, they'll give you this inventory and you'll fill in the little form like, you know, how often do I feel down one to five and you feel in like four. So yeah. they'll get a score and they'll say, well, your score is 84. So you, you, Meet the, meet the criteria of depression. And then after the 12 week program, they'll say, well, they did the same thing again and now their score is only 51. So clearly what we've done has been helpful. And I think that's true. And I think a lot of the cognitive behavior stuff is helpful. Sure. I find it helpful in the short term. I'm not that 
convinced that it helps long term. So the thing about university programs is they're very conservative. Whereas what I'm seeing now, what really helps with people is going into your body and feeling where this trauma is stored in your body and trying to process it from that way. Because I, I do think that a lot of people with anxiety, because they have this alarm stored in their body and they don't want to go down into their body at all costs, they stay up in their heads. And the best way to keep yourself busy in your head is to worry. So you worry and you worry and you worry, and that worry prevents you from going back down into your solar plexus, your heart area, where all this stuff is stored. So that makes perfect sense to me. But when you when you see somebody in a in a in a you know a trauma setting, and you deal with them, like where do you feel that in your body? Like, is there a color to it? Is there a shape to it, or whatever? Like you can't quantify that so much in a university setting. It's a very, very much like you know what I do with patients, and I kind of see them, and and I and I look at them, and I I kind of get a bit of their history, and I get this feeling. I can't explain that in a how-to guide to another doctor, like how I do that, because it's just it's this kind of it's it's a feeling-based thing, and I think you know to heal feeling-based problems. We need a feeling-based solution, and a lot of the university training programs are based on metrics, and they're based on repeatable how-to programs. And often, with patients, you know, they need the connection. They need that personal connection. Not saying that the the psychologist can't give that, but just you know, looking more into the body rather than just you know constantly trying to figure out okay well your father hit you so you know how did that affect you and your brother and then you know asking all these questions as opposed to going where do you feel that you know can we bring that out can we find that area in your body that you're holding these old unresolved traumas can we find that and can we kind of just sort of sit with it rather than just talk back and forth can we sit with that pain and then ask sometimes i'll get people to say well what what's that pain telling you or you know, if you could, if like if I could talk to my 12, which I've done hundreds of times, and, and I sit beside my 12 year old and I say, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult for you watching your dad being taken away in that ambulance. I know it is. And then I just wait and see what he says. You know, sometimes he has a little tear. Or sometimes he, he just gets completely confused. But it's one of the little tricks that I use to, to connect with your inner child. And I know this sounds really woo, but, but you know, what trauma did you go through? You know, you said when you, you know, your dad, you kind of lost your dad emotionally when you were seven, you know, have you ever gone back and talked to seven-year-old Leah and said, you know, was it really, how was it for you when, when mom told you that dad was sick? You know, have you ever had that conversation with her? I have because just because I, you know, I know about, in this. Stuff about reparenting and stuff. Yeah. So I started having those conversations with different age, different aged Leah's. I should put it that right. way. I also yeah. look at pictures of myself at a certain age so that it's easier for me to visually connect with that age. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you get some of the feelings back when you see a picture. And oh, so absolutely. Like you can really have a good connection with that era of your life. Absolutely. I was going to show you on my phone that, that uh, my, my screensaver is, uh, but it won't go off until it goes off. My screensaver is me at three years old. And when, when it goes off here, I'll, I'll see if I can put it up to the screen, but I see him every day, you know, and he's three years old and it's like, I have a little, I don't talk to him every day, but there's a lot of times where I just yeah. kind of go, you know. I think it? that is very, like, there is reparenting therapy and self-reparenting, which, so it's already a thing, but I honestly think something about bringing in pictures would yeah. elevate that a bit. Or maybe that's yeah. already done. I haven't really researched it in depth, but I think that pictures hold a lot of, well, like, they do, just, just because the way, from a neuroscience point of view, the way that we the way that we see our vision, there's about four or five separate and distinct brain areas for vision. It's not just like you're projecting it on a screen. Mm. Um, so there's a number of, there's a number of uh, inferences from vision that we get that we would never be consciously aware of bringing up. So if you, you know, sometimes I'll go on Google Maps and I'll, I'll do that thing where you can go on the car and you go and you look at your old, I look at my old places where I used to yes. live. And it's like, I don't remember that place beside me. Like, was that always a store? Right. You know? And it's just like, I, I would have never remembered that. And then I think back and it's like, yeah, of course it was. I mean, I used to go out and get milk there and, you know, pop and chips and all that. So it's funny how those, those different, same with smell. 
smell is one of those things that you know we smell something and it can evoke smell is one of the most powerful evoker that's the yep. word uh of memories I did now <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so often like so i use things like essential oils with people to bring them into the moment because i think so often when we get lost in these traumas mm -hmm. you know there's a part of our brain called the amygdala and the amygdala never forgets it never forgets anything. There's a part beside that called the hippocampus. And what it does is it kind of t puts a time date, date stamp on a memory. So when you bring back that memory into awareness, it feels like it's a memory. It feels like it's coming from the past. But the problem with that is that cortisol and adrenaline will paralyze the hippocampus. And then what, what we'll get is the only thing that encodes that memory now is the amygdala. It used to be the hippocampus and the amygdala. When you paralyze the hippocampus, the amygdala is the only thing that, that encodes that memory. And the amygdala has no sense of time. So when, you, when one of those memories comes back into awareness, it doesn't feel like it's coming from the past. It feels like it's still happening. You know, because I'll still have episodes where, where I think my dad's still alive and he, he died 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll still have, you know, it doesn't last long, but it's sure. still that, that feeling, the that, feeling that he's still... There. He's, I could come around the corner or I'll see someone who looks like him and, and it'll, it'll bring up that same feeling. And because I haven't fully processed all of the trauma around that, there's part of that amygdala that fires up and says to me, this is still happening. And, and that's the part that we have to treat. And that's the part we have to sort of move people through and, you know, bring the hippocampus back online with smell or whatever to bring people into the moment so that they can almost go back time state that time dates that that memory mm -hmm. so that now it's like oh yeah that happened in the past i don't have to worry about it anymore so you can bring the hippocampus back online you're saying by 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 putting yourself into the present moment so things like touch will do that touching your face will do that mm -hmm. there's a bunch of things because sensation you have to feel in the moment like sensation is something that you feel in the moment and that's so grounding it's, right is that what yeah that absolutely yeah, okay. Okay. And, and essential oils will do that too. Like essential oils, smell is the only sense that isn't pre-processed in the brain. There's a, a nucleus in the brain called the thalamus and touch, taste, um, uh, hearing, sight, all go through the thalamus first before it gets put to the brain, where a smell goes right into the emotional brain immediately. It's not pre-processed. It goes in immediately which I think was, you know, part of our evolution. If we were, you know, if we could smell a predator or smell a warring tribe, you know, it, it, it suited us to get going right away. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I think we still have that ability to use smell to bring us into the present moment immediately. And I think when you're in the present moment, you can start bringing the, the hippocampus back online where it wasn't, you know, when you had that trauma when you're seven or 10 or 12 years old. Now you can bring the hippocampus back online because you're grounded in the present moment. And now you can actually go back and time date stand that memory. So it almost feels like that's over. It's not happening anymore. So it doesn't create the same alarm in the system. Very fascinating. So you are saying that the only one of the five senses that doesn't have to go through the thalamus yep. is smell. Yep, that's the only one. It's the only one that isn't pre-processed. And that's why it's such a power... That's why it's so powerful. Yes, that makes so much sense because smells are like I've noticed. I'm like, whoa, like I can be calm with a smell or mm -hmm. I can be, you know, like alarmed by a smell. Absolutely. Okay, that is very fascinating. Yeah. You're teaching me so much today and I've researched tons over the last 13 years. I feel like I'm learning so much. But the mind and body have what you call a feedback loop. Yep. And maybe you already said something about that, but I didn't hear you mention that term. And I just kind of wanted you to explain that just a little bit. I think it's more almost a, an ethereal idea that the, because you can't separate the mind from the body. I mean, you know, we can, and, and that's something allopathic medicine does is it basically separates yeah. things out. Okay. You've got a liver disease, a kidney disease, whatever. But I think there is this kind of loop that we get. And I think, you know, to get a little woo, I think a lot of a love we hold in our body. You know, so if you have a lot of stress and you have this alarm in your body as well, and you can't go into your body because you don't want to revisit that stress anymore because that's where it's stored, you'll stay in your head. So that normal flow of energy that flows from your mind into your body and keeps flowing and it's just sort of a natural ebb and flow like the waves in the ocean back and forth, we lose that. Right. And when we lose that, then we're sitting ducks for disease, physical and emotional, because we're not getting that flow through us. 
anymore. Now, I, I realize this is kind of like more of a ethereal kind of spiritual thing, and it's not on a, you know, you can never explain. I could never talk about this to a group of doctors. <laughs> they, they'd shoot me on the spot. They need you to, though. We need to be educating well, doctors who haven't gone through the training that you have because this is way too important and affects way too many people for them not to know. I, I'm just yeah. so curious about it. And I, I love it when a doctor, because Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate, yep. he will talk to doctors. Absolutely. And have that kickback yep. and that, nope. But I feel like eventually, once it really resonates with the truth within, they get it. And I think that's one of the reasons why doctors are burned out so much because I think they're really feeling at almost an ethereal spiritual level that just giving people medications to mask their problems isn't really helping them. You know, so, you know, some like the guy with the shoulder, you know, I could have given that guy, you know, morphine. You know, and that's and that would have that would have worked for a couple of months, and then he needed a higher dose of morphine because it wasn't the, the pain really wasn't in his shoulder; it was this emotional pain that he was carrying. So you know, we have to be able to see that as physicians, and I think the reasons why doctors are burning out so allopathic doctors mm -hmm. is they really see this whole paradigm of you know when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If right. you're trained in this drug, you know, pharmaceutical complex or in comp you know it is one of those things that when you see somebody you start thinking okay what would be a good medication for them because you have 10 minutes seven to ten minutes and you're you're you know in the first two or three minutes i'm going okay what can, what are my possible treatment options here and i have written on prescriptions before you know take a vacation take your wife to dinner you know go to the gym and then give it because it, you know when you write something on a prescription pad it's god at that point it's you could write you know give me a thousand dollars and they would i would hand it to them at the end of the at the end of the thing and they would look at it like like, what's this? It's like, this is what you should do. This is my prescription. But that flow you're talking about is that I think that's the flow of health. I think that's what happens. And I think when we store trauma in there that isn't, that isn't processed, that flow gets blocked. And then when you get a blockage, you know, coronary artery, stroke, whatever, when you get a blockage and it doesn't have to be physical, you know, things don't flow through there anymore. And I see people age, like I'm going to be, what is it? I'm going to be 60 at the end of this year. So it's like, I try and do my yoga. I try, you know, despite the fact that I've been anxious my whole life, you know, I try and keep this sort of flow going and, and, and it works. It seem, it really seems to help me just the idea that I'm flowing. And I have this little circuit that I do. I just imagine like the flow going this way and then the flow going reverse back up and down. And then I go the flow in my mind this way and then the other way. Yeah. And then I just imagine that for like a minute, like just, the flow, you know? Yeah. So whatever you're doing is working because you honestly look 45. We could ask probably our entire audience, how old do you look? I get, that. Look I get that a lot. Doing something right. Just, just having that flow state, you know, and just going into it and doing what I love. Like I love helping people find where their blocks are and removing them. You know, some yeah. people are highly resistant to it, but at least they'll know. I've had people come back to me 10 years later and go, you know, you told me I was blocked about my mother and her relationship with her uncle and I just mm -hmm. denied it. And it's like, yeah, okay, 10 years, 10 years. Yeah. And then we work on it. And then, you know, his chronic, you know, gastroesophageal stuff is gone. It's amazing how much stuff presents in the body because it's just a blockage in your mind. It's an unresolved trauma that you hold that you don't want to let go of because on some level, the child in you believes that that blockage is, is, is keeping you safe. It's like shielding you from stuff. You have such a great approach. I know you've been writing and getting more degrees and all of that the last seven years, but are you going to ever see patients again? Because to me, it's like, man, we're going to be missing out on a great doctor. You know, what I found was when I, when I was working with people is that it, and I haven't learned how to do this very well, but when I would see people and I would go into them and I would see and I would feel because I have a little bit of medical intuitive issue as problem or, or uh, it's not a problem, but it's just an ability to do it. And uh, I, I would find that it would just it would tire me out. Mm. And, it, and it, you know, and, and when I would see people who were abused when they were when they were young, you know, it, it's it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. it's just it just it crushes me. You know, when I when I go into them and I feel their pain. It's, it's so, it can be so devastating sometimes um, when I feel the intense pain of, you know, someone who's been physically, emotionally, sexually abused, uh, you know, as a four-year-old or an eight-year-old, it's, it's so hard. My answer today 
in June of 2020 <laughs> is probably not, you know, I'll pro but I probably, what I probably will do is I will probably run programs, you know, like on, mm -hmm. you know, online and that kind of stuff, maybe have like eight or 12 people, uh, see them once a week. And then we can kind of go through in a group format, you know, cause everybody's, there's no new, there's no new problems. They're all just recycled, you know? Yeah. So I may see somebody with, you know, with, um, you know, chronic um, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And I may have other, you know, men in, in, the, in, the, in the group and they would have no idea what that was about, but they would have another issue where they were kind of losing vitality, you know? And then we, you know, so helping one person, because our problems are all really just the same, you know, it's this, you know, yeah. wanting to be seen, heard and loved. I've yet to work with somebody in a group where every other person in the group didn't get a whole lot from it too. Yes. I'm you know. serious. I did group therapy once. Yeah. I got so much out of that. And it was like a two day conference thing. I could not believe it. Like I felt yeah. like I was healing when everyone else was talking. Yeah. Sometimes it takes the pressure off you. Like if you're not in the hot seat, if you're not the one that they're interviewing and, and so you can actually sit back and almost heal by proxy from them yeah. so that you you don't have the pressure of like, Oh, I hope I don't say something wrong. I hope I don't release something I don't want to talk about. Um, so you can allow them to kind of do that and you can sit back and just sort of feel, you know, I work sometimes with Mark Willin who, um, he wrote a book called, it didn't start with you. Do you know Mark Willin? I don't. And I need okay. to read yeah. it. Okay. It's a fantastic book. It's called, it didn't start with you. And it's about inherited family trauma, right. you know, and he's just a master at being able to sort of see into people and, 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 and see where their issues are. And he kind of does these family constellations where he, you know, pick somebody for your mother, pick somebody for your father, pick somebody for your brother. And it's amazing the energetic field that forms from that. And he's written a book, a very scientific book about that called It Didn't Start With You. And, um, and Mark and I are friends and, and we talk about this because, you know, people come up to me and they say, you know, I, I didn't, I had a great childhood. You know, I didn't really have much trauma. I didn't have any, any issues at all. And, and I said, well, what about your parents? Like, well, you know, my parents survived the war. It's like, bingo, you know, we can hand trauma down through, you know, through very different means, um, non-coding DNA, non-coding RNA. Rachel Yehuda out of Mount Sinai University or Mount Sinai in New York, she does studies with uh, children of Holocaust survivors okay. and sees where their stresses come from. You know, and their stresses are, you know, much more common than the general population. And they, you know, they had fairly good childhoods, you know, so it, it's, it's, I find that stuff fascinating. Like, where oh. does your trauma come from? Oh, a hundred percent. Same here. Like, <laughs> I think that's why we were connected is because we kind of, you know, think similarly when it comes to that stuff. So of all the body mind focused therapies, which do you believe are the most effective in promoting true and long lasting health? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of an oxymoron because you're talking about therapies because usually people are sick when they go in. But I guess, you know, what I would, you know, my wife is, she's done somatic experiencing therapy, mm -hmm. you know, so she's accredited in that. Okay. Um, so I think that's really powerful. Anything that really looks at the body mm -hmm. uh, as well as the mind. I am not, you know, I am not anti-talk therapy. I mean, some people will accuse me of that. And it's, no, I believe that, you know, as Dr. Dan Siegel says, I think we do need a coherent narrative to explain what happened in our lives. Yeah. But I think what happens in therapy is we almost re-traumatize people by going over their traumas over and over and over again, thinking mm -hmm. that somehow this time it's going to, you know, everything's going to break open and it's going to be some goodwill hunting moment where everything kind of, oh my God, I'm completely cured now. So it's a combination, I think. So I think what we need to do is we need to address the body and the mind as well, because if, if we don't address the body, that's, and, and that's where, you know, a lot of the traumas are hiding yes. and finding it and trying to unearth it and trying to make that connection with that younger self who's still hiding behind that tree in fright or shame or judgment or whatever, whatever they're there. You know, if we don't deal with that on a, on a, on a feeling level, because it's a feeling problem, anxiety, depression, OCD, all, it, it, it's a feeling problem. And if we don't deal with it on a feeling level, we're really never going to get to the bottom of it. So it's like, you know, one of my favorite saying is, you know, you can't heal a feeling problem with a thinking solution. Yeah. So it, it really is, but you need both. Like I'm not anti, so, so Hakomi, um, uh, somatic experiencing therapy, um, they're doing, like I said, we were talking early on about essential oils. They're starting to really sort of use 
that those kind of therapies into bringing people into the moment like with addiction i think you know we're going to see a lot more psychedelics being used ketamine is now being used quite broadly now in psychotherapy mm -hmm. um low to, microdosing psilocybin is a really popular popular thing now mm -hmm. um ayahuasca less so because it's such a sledgehammer um you mean it LSD, hits you hard pardon me when you say sledgehammer you mean it hits you hard like you oh have yeah to, like, yeah it. yeah yeah, yeah, because I, you know, I've done ayahuasca. That ayahuasca was, and I used to get panic attacks. Still do every once in a while, um, but I, you know, and I've had some pretty bad panic attacks. And ayahuasca was probably panic attack multiplied by a hundred. Like it was the most hands down, really, without a doubt, frightening. And yet, other people will say, "Oh, it was the most blissful." And and I have and I have a reason for that. I think because I lived in my head for so long. Right. I lived in sort of you know, and what I lived in my ego my ego protection for so long that what the psychedelics do, and this is being shown now in FMRI, FMRI scanners and stuff is they, okay. they, they disarm the ego, you know? So, and, oh, and so if your ego is, if your constant thinking and your constant ego is the only thing keeping you protected or so you think, mm -hmm. and that the psychedelics remove that, you go into this abyss oh, wow. where there is nothing to hold <laughs> on to. And that's what I, that's what I kept saying. That's what I kept saying apparently in the, in the ayahuasca experiences, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to hold on to. And I was panicked. I was like, you know, I talk about it a little bit in the book and, and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's a fear I have never, I, I don't really recommend oh. psychedelics to people. That know? is interesting because I kind of had this wary feeling toward them anyways. I mean, if they help, great, but it just didn't feel safe to me. But you also wrote the article, How I Finally Healed from Anxiety with LSD and yep. an enlightened medical doctor. So tell me the difference. Why would, why does LSD have a different effect? Maybe from well, a neuroscience standpoint. All the psychedelics act a little bit differently, but the main thing that they do is they take your ego away from you, right? Okay. So your ego is what, you know, steps in when you're a child, your ego steps in to protect you is okay. basically what happens. I have this part of my book where, you know, a lot of scandal, Scandinavian folklore have this dragon sitting on top of this treasure chest. Okay. So you have to go through the dragon before you can get to the treasure, you know? So I think when we're children, we make these imaginary dragons up to protect us. So when I felt lonely as a child, uh, what the dragon would do for me is it would sort of, you know, close me in. It would make me feel, you know, like I go into dorsal vagal shutdown, essentially, yeah. you know? But I saw that as protective, Sure. right? Because as a child, it, it probably would have been on some level protective. Right. Mm -hmm. But as an adult trying to function in the world, being in dorsal vagal shutdown is not going to help you in relationships, in your job or any of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So when, when that ego dragon comes in and it sort of takes you over and it protects you, mm -hmm. you don't have a get a, you don't have a chance to grow at that point. So you get you get caught in this cycle of, of you know, always being in protection. And I think to grow, we need to get outside of that. So when we take psychedelics, we lose that ego protection, but we start seeing the other thing that I saw is that, you know, I'm connected to everything. This body, this form that I'm in, as young as it looks, is still, is still just a, a temporary form. It's not, I, I'm connected to everything outside of, you know, outside of this. And I think that's what the psychedelics do is they really give you a different frame of reference on life in general, because you live in this, we live in our egos, we live in our protective egos every day okay so when that gets taken away from you you are forced to look at, at, at different options of living your life which is what happened with me so why did lsd work for you but i don't remember the name um, of the other one yeah uh ayahuasca? ayahuasca i think ayahuasca just blew the back of my head off you know <laughs> i think that was just like <laughs> uh with lsd i did it with a friend of mine who's a uh um ayurvedic doctor herbalist specialist probably the smartest guy i know um, and he was with me the whole time. So I felt like I was, it was still scary for sure, but I felt like I was sort of held in, with somebody that I knew and that kind of thing. And basically, you know, it did scatter my mind for the first three hours, according to him, that I, that I did it. And then as I came out of it, I started seeing different things. And what I saw on that was that my anxiety wasn't really in my mind at all. It was basically in this little place in my chest. And it showed me it was this purple crystalline kind of irregular shaped sharp uh, and it put a pressure up on my heart so mm. as i came out of it i thought okay well that's weird um 
I've always thought that my, my anxiety was in my mind, mm -hmm. but you're showing me that it's in my body. And then once I started adopt, adapting that, and then I, I started doing some of Dr. Gordon Neufeld's work um, in developmental psychology, mm -hmm. and he coined this term called alarm. And it's like, yeah, well, that's, that's, as soon as I heard it, I thought, well, that's exactly what it is. It's actually the sense of alarm that's locked in my body. And ever since I started treating that, I've been, I've gotten like worlds better. You know, I, I did 25 years of EMDR, CBT, you know, you name it, I, you know, interpersonal therapy, you know, you name it, I've done it. And it didn't really seem to help. But until I really started addressing it through the body, and that's why I like somatic experiencing and that kind of thing. Uh, until I started experiencing it through the body, nothing really seemed to work for me. And I really, and the reason I did the psychedelics in the first place coming full circle is I was suicidal in 2013. Like I was, you know, not like I'm going to jump off a bridge tomorrow, but it was like, I can't live the rest of my life like this. Yeah, so I was I desperate. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why Todd said, well, you know, we'll take you on an LSD experience. And that basically saved my life. Wow. Oh yeah. my goodness, that is fascinating. In that same article, you referenced the quote, physician, heal thyself. And you've kind of touched on this the entire time we've been talking. Yeah. But how have you taken this practice seriously? And what ways have you kind of applied this to your own human experience? Yeah. Well, I wasn't getting a lot of help from, you know, allopathic medicine or yeah. conventional psychiatry or psychology or even things like EMDR, CBT, um, all those ACT, all those therapies didn't really help me. So it's like, well, I'm going to have to find a way of helping myself. So I went to India. I sat on a rooftop in India for a while, meditated, did some yoga, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I was enlightened for about 90 minutes. And that was similar to the ayahuasca experience, but not, near, not, not painful. It was all this bliss. Right. So 90 minutes of enlightenment is all I've got so far. <laughs> but it was one of those things, but it was just, I started going, I, I, you know, I did Byron Katie school for the work. I don't know if you know Byron Katie, she, she does this um, inquiry process where, you know, four questions at a turnaround. So I went to Ojai, California and I did that. Um, so I did all these different, you know, kind of workshops and, and, and kind of personal development programs Yeah. and nothing really seemed to, to, to do much until I really started working with finding this place in my body, finding this, you know, younger part of me that was still hurting. And, and until I did that, uh, I didn't really make much progress. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot more to that. Um, but, you know, allopathic medicine doesn't address that. And again, because in universities, they can't quantify it, you know, that, that you can't sort of say, okay, tell me about your inner child from one to 10. Like it just, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. So, <laughs> so and because they can't quantify it, they don't teach it. And, you know, very few people kind of get it. So that's why I like these body-based therapies, because they give you a bit of both. You can, you have a bit of story, but you also get into you. So what I did was I, I basically started just like going out and doing things that were a little unorthodox and then that would lead me to something else and then that would lead me to like essential oils and then that would lead me to yoga and that would lead me to all these different other things and i would just keep accumulating things that worked and and sort of you know kind of pushing off to the side stuff that didn't and um you know some of the more spiritual stuff really helped some of the more um you know cbt stuff does still help um but you know i i think it was one of those things where I'm going to have to heal myself because if I look at, you know, the, the upper echelon of all these, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever, nothing was really working. Right. So I had to really just, I had to really go out and go to India and, and, and really find my own healing. And that's, you know, I think the people that, one of the things that I say in some, some of my bios is that, you know, it's rare you'll see a, a medical doctor who specializes in the same ailment that they have themselves, you know, so. <laughs> So that's, that's basically what I am. You know, I specialize in anxiety and I have anxiety. So, yeah. so, and, and when people say, well, you know, what's your, what's your big accreditation? Is it your neuroscience, your medicine? It's, and it's, no, it's, it's living with anxiety for 30 years. That's my, that's my main school is, is, is having it in my body, waking up with it every day. That's, that's my school of how I know I'm getting better and how I know things work. Yeah. And one of the things I used to say was, you know, I didn't have to, you know, get something from the doctor and go back in two weeks and check in with the doctor. I am the damn doctor. Like, like I am the guy, right? So <laughs> I didn't, you know, I could, I could, I could find out if something worked right away because I knew whether or not it was going to work or not. So that's what I meant by physician heal thyself. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. So 
one last question before we go, because I don't even know. I think I've taken a lot of your time, but um, oh, how how could someone use breath work, kind of as a as a form of self therapy if they're not ready to jump all the way into somatic therapy or psychedelics or some of the other things you've talked about? Yeah, I mean, somatic therapy people could jump into because any somatic therapist worth their salt is going to take them, is going to titrate them in slowly. You know, you're not going to go, you know, show me the place your father punched you in the head. You know, they're not going to say, they're not going to do that. It's going to be one of these things where they're trained to kind of just titrate, to bring you into it slowly. So, so you can go into somatic therapy almost right away. Okay. Breath work is, uh, I, had a, I had a lady talk to me the other day. She was from Florida. And she she was really distraught, and she said, "You know, I'm looking at doing, um, was it LSD? I think it was uh, ayahuasca. Okay, ayahuasca. Maybe it was one of the psychedelics. Anyway, and she and I said, well, you know, because you're a little anxious, and you know, you probably leaned on your ego most of your life. Mm -hmm. Doing a psychedelic may just blow the back of your head off. Why don't you consider doing something called holotropic breath work? And she was at one of the major cities in 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 Florida." So, you know, I know they'd have it, but basically it was invented by Dr. Stan Groff, uh, Stan Groff and his wife, Christina. And um, it's this, uh, th they would notice that when they gave their patients LSD, this is back in the fifties when LSD was still legal, right. when they would give their pa patients LSD for psychotherapy, the ones that had the best benefit would actually go into this hyperventilatory breathing where they'd be like, mm -hmm. <sighs> sure. and sometimes they'd be in it for, you know, half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half. And they noticed that the people that had the best response would have would have the, you know that type of breathing. So when LSD became illegal, uh, then what they 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 thought, well, I wonder if we I wonder if we just did the breath, if the breath would work. And and sure enough, it works. Uh, sure, if it helps, it it helps people go into this what they call non ordinary state, which allows kind of to bypass the ego, which is basically what LSD does in the first place. Mm -hmm. And you do this hyperventilation breathing for, you know, sometimes as long as, you know, two, two and a half hours. And um, it does help. I've done it probably 15, 20 times, but it's, it's, it's a very a gentle introduction to, you know, displacing your ego uh, as opposed to going into, you know, blowing the back of your brains out with, you know, with LSD or ayahuasca or psilocybin. So, you know, I, I highly recommend it. For, it's safe. It's effective. I think pregnant women can't do it or there's a couple, there's a couple of uh, contraindications, but in general, you know, it's very safe. Um, and it, it, it's really helpful. I, I find it really helps people. And that woman from Florida, like emailed me back and oh, said, yeah. That was great. That was it. Was it was the it was exactly what I needed at the time. So, yeah. so it's it's just it's kind of like you know I rarely recommend psychedelics to people. In fact, I can't remember the last time I did. I usually try and talk people out of it. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. If there's something yeah. else that works, there's no need to go yeah. to the extreme like that. Yeah. So you are writing your first book. Is that right? I am. And it's <laughs> called The Anxiety RX. Yep. Anything that you can share about it, like little secrets, insights, or is it all top secret for now? Uh, no, it's not top secret. Uh, okay. It basically sort of goes into my, a lot of my life, a lot of the, the life of the, my patients who've had anxiety and uh, the similarities and the differences that I noticed with them, what worked with them, what didn't work with them. There's a book called Eat, Pray, Love that came out, I think, in early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth Gilbert wrote it, and, and she wrote it in 108 chapters. Right. So there was 36, 36, and 36. So the first 36 chapters of my book are, and they're short chapters. They're not like, sure. like long chapters. Yeah. But the first 36 chapters are, are how the mind works in anxiety, how the mind works against you in anxiety. The second 36 chapters are how anxiety is really this alarm in the body and explaining really kind of with patient details and in my own life where I feel my anxiety. This is where sort of LSD and stuff comes into it and, and what you can do about it how you can find your alarm in your system. And the last 36 chapters are basically establishing that flow again that I was talking about. So that, so taking the block away so that you can go back into your, you can go back into your body again. So it's safe to go back in there right. and reestablish that flow mm -hmm. uh, through your system. And then that, you know, brings you back into mental and physical, you know, kind of health. So that's what I, you know, that's basically what the book is all about. And, you know, it was brilliant. You said earlier on, cause it's the anxiety prescription. Cause initially I'd never heard that before because anyone asked me before what the name of the book was called, I'd say the anxiety RX because like the RX behind me 
there. Mm -hmm. Like it's the first thing at the top of the prescription pad. But when you said the anxiety prescription, it's like, oh, Leah, I knew there was a reason why I liked you. This is awesome. Because (laughs) yeah, and I think that word. And it's funny because my mom was a nurse too. And so I was raised with a little bit of, you know, medical knowledge. She wasn't an RN. She was just an LPN or whatever it's called. So, but I just remember her talking, she would write RX. Yeah. And I knew what that meant because, you know, she yeah. taught us. Well, I am excited to read your book when it comes out. And I hope that we can have you back on around that Hopefully, time. I know sure. you'll be booked with all this these is, interviews. No, no. You've got a special place in my heart. This will work out <laughs> well. This was very fun. This is very fun, for yeah, sure. It was. And so I'm going to link, like, everything that you talked about in the description. Sure. So that people sure. can learn more. Because, honestly, you covered so much ground. I knew you were I, going to. I, I talk fast. I want, yeah. And I, you're supposed I, to talk. I'm passionate people. about this. You know, I am too, but yeah, I don't talk as fast as you do. Maybe someday I'll start, but I want people to be able to go back and, you know, look at everything that you talk sure. about. I'm going to put links for your profiles, your articles, everything in the description, and then hopefully we'll get to talk to you again soon. So. Oh, you will for sure. You will Thanks for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, yeah. Dr. Kennedy.